Okay, part two of forces and motion. We're dealing with uh, forces that are written as vectors. We need to get to grips with this because the forces we looked at in part one were all horizontal or vertical. Now clearly in real life, vectors don't always apply themselves just vertically or horizontally. They'll come in at various angles. Uh, so we need to know how to, how to write them. One way to deal with it is to write your force as a vector. So for example, vector P here, if you imagine these three vectors are drawn to scale, which we wouldn't normally do, but just to help the understanding. So vector P here starts here, goes up to here, and just like we would do with coordinates, uh, we count how many along, one, two, three, four along, and three up. There's a couple of ways of writing this. You can either write it as you would have done in um, GCSE maths, four along, Three up, you can write it like that. Or you can write it as engineers prefer to write it um, as P equals 4I plus 3J. I being a unit vector horizontally, to the right is positive, to the left is negative. And J being a unit vector vertically, positive J being upwards, negative J being downwards. So I and J are unit vectors horizontally and vertically. So Q written in traditional form would be one along and three down or an IJ form we would write it as Q is one I or just I take three J. Vector R, the last one here, is minus four, zero. Or we could write it as three equals minus four i. So that's how we would write those three vectors. It makes it a lot easier now to add two vectors together using either of these forms, either with brackets or with i's and j's. And what you do is to add two vectors together, you simply add together the i components or the horizontal components and then you add together the J components or the vertical components. So P plus Q, P is 4I, Q is 1I, so 4I plus 1I would give you 5I. Now dealing with the J's, you've got 3J, take away 3J is naught. So P plus Q would just be 5I. And if you do the diagram, head to tail, so P goes like that, Q would come down here to be at that point. If I take this vector and plant it here, it would come down to this point, which you can see to go from there, from there to there would be 5 positive. Q plus R similarly, deal with the I's first, 1I minus 4I would be minus 3I. R has no J component, so you just consider the J component of Q, minus 3I, minus 3J. And again, if you put these two vectors together, head to tail, so Q would be here, start here with R, minus 4, we'll take it to there, and you end up with that vector as your resultant vector. So a little question here, P plus Q plus R, is P plus Q plus R resultant zero force, in other words, is the resultant to zero? Does it leave the original object in equilibrium? Well, let's have a look. P plus Q plus R, let's consider the I components. P plus Q plus R equals the I components first. So 4I plus 1I is 5I. Take 4I is 1I. I should just write it as I. Now consider the J components, 3J, minus 3j is 0j plus 0j. I have no j's here, so there are no j's. So p plus q plus r is i. So it's not a, it's not a resultant zero force. The resultant force is just i. And again, if you did the diagram head to tail, p to q, q to r, sorry, p, then to q, then to r, you'd end up back here giving you positive i. 
So that's, um, that's how we can deal with writing, or one way of dealing with writing vectors that are at an angle. You can write them either as vectors in brackets or in i and j form. There's another way which requires a little bit of trigonometry, and that's to deal with it in terms of the magnitude of the resultant vector and the angle. Be careful with the angle, because sometimes we're dealing with an angle as a bearing, in other words, from north, going clockwise, and sometimes we'll deal with it from um, another base point, another zero point, often the x-axis going anti-clockwise. So it just depends on the context. Read the question carefully as to which direction you're going in. Let's have a look at Q plus R. Let's actually work it out. Q plus R. Um, we've got it here, minus 3i, minus 3j. So Q plus R is minus 3i, minus 3j. If we actually draw that, let's have that as our starting point. Minus 3i, minus 3j would take us to there. Um, the magnitude of this, simple bit of Pythagoras, that's 3, that's 3, so that's 3, that's 3 using Pythagoras, a squared equals b squared plus c squared, <coughs> then a squared is 9 plus 9, a squared is 18, a equals the square root of 18, which we can rewrite in simplified third form, well this is 9 times 2, so it's 3 root 2. So the magnitude of this resultant vector is 3 root 2. Okay, the direction. Well, here it depends on which, which angle we're looking at. If we're starting from north, if it's a bearing and we're starting from north, as naught, then we're looking at this angle here. That's 180, this is 45, so the bearing would be 225 degrees. The direction would be 225 degrees, that's the bearing. Or we could have it starting from the x-axis, which would be here. If I use the red pen. And often if we're starting from the x-axis, we would go anti-clockwise, so we'd want this angle here. Uh, 90, 180, plus the 45, 225 degrees. For this particular one, the um, direction from X or the direction as a bearing happens to be the same. So the direction of the angle would be theta is 225 degrees. So now we know how to put arrows onto our diagram to show where the forces are, and we know how to deal with forces that are at an angle. We can either write them in bracket form, in ij form, we know how to add them together, or we can write them as a direction and a magnitude, depending on what the question wants us to do.